Welcome back to White Sox Weekly on the ESPN 1000 White Sox Network. I'm Connor McKnight. We are at Guaranteed Rate Field, and I look forward to having some soft sell, soft serve, soft serve here at the ballpark when I get a chance. Our next guest is Jason Benetti. You know him as the television voice of the White Sox. That's incidentally how I know him as well. Jason, thanks so much for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Good to talk with you. You too, Connor. Good to hear your voice again. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so our, our start of the season has been a fun one. The White Sox are one and one. But I, I want to start somewhere else. I know you're prepping for the game, so you likely haven't heard our newest bit here on White Sox Weekly. Um, we've been doing Ask Len on Twitter, where fans get a chance to ask Len Casper questions during the game, right? Saturdays, okay. yep, I saw that. We, f- we flipped the script, and it's Len Asks. So he asked White Sox fans just a little while ago on the show, where is your favorite place to listen to baseball on the radio, the physical location where you enjoy most listening to baseball on the radio. I, I have to ask you the same question. I know you haven't had a chance to listen to a lot of baseball on the radio, what with doing television, but where would you pick? Uh, so the number one place for me is my car. I mean, sure. when, you're, when you're sitting in traffic, there's nothing better than listening to baseball on the radio because it sort of tempers the, the um, penchant for road rage, if we're being honest. Len, Len and DJ have such soothing voices that when you want to swerve past somebody in the other lane, they, they make you not do that by saying, playing a ground ball is short. It's comforting, it's loving, and it's caring, and it's really something I'm glad to be a part of. Is that the answer you were looking for? Absolutely. Uh, anything that allays okay. your road rage is good by me. Uh-huh. I don't want you freaking <laughs> out on anybody on 94 or 290, for that yeah. matter. My word, that's a, that's a nightmare sometimes. Jason, I, I spoke with Rick Hahn a little bit earlier in the show, and we talked a lot about the – the trust, the confidence that he gave an opportunity to go earn for some of these young White Sox relievers, Hoyer, Foster, all these guys. Um, wonder if you, I assume you and Stoney talked a bit about that, but I wonder what hit you most about those opportunities for some of those young White Sox relievers over the first two nights. I, to me, it's yesterday, Michael Kopech getting to come out and throw to Mike Trout after he had already gone for six batters worth of outs. And for Tony La Russa to say, hey, you know, whoever, whoever I've got, I believe in, I think there's a lot of good there. Um, and I think already we see that these relievers know that if it's their night, they might pitch in an important spot. And so, yeah, I mean, I, it's an easy bullpen to do this with, I think, to, to believe in everybody out there. But I think we've seen the last couple nights, number, the number one thing for me is the intent with which Tony La Russa manages his bullpen. There is always a strategy. There's always an idea. There's always some reason for something that's beyond what's on the surface. And so I think it's exciting as a fan to watch him handle the bullpen. And it's got to be exciting for those pitchers down there to know that they're not just the seventh guy down there, or I can't pitch you in this spot. I mean, it's, it's early in the season, but it seems as though there's nobody that's going to be tabbed as that. Yeah, we've we've seen a couple of young ball players make their debuts as well. Andrew Vaughn in left last night, but your mean Mercedes has had all the headli- headlines. Uh, DJ called his first hit. I know Stoney's a master of prognostication. Did he see a big night for Mercedes? Uh, Steve called Tim Anderson's home run last night. Shocker. Uh, neither of us. I'm sad to say neither of us had the five for five. Uh, <laughs> that shockingly. Um, but yeah, no. Um, look. It's thrilling for the kid, and and I say kid, but he's been through the car wash of minor league baseball and everything, as I'm sure the guys talked about last night. I mean, it's 10 years worth of up and down, and I might quit, and I I won't quit, but I'm thinking that this might not happen and still believing that it would happen. And so, no, I don't think any of us us saw it coming, but the post-game interview we had with Mercedes was just a beautiful thing. I mean, here's a guy who just has unbridled joy for the game of baseball and what it can do for somebody. And I I don't know. I, I just think that that's one of those stories that happened day two of the season. And I sincerely hope none of us forgets it after game 162. You know, you've, you've been a lot of, around a lot of clubhouses, Jason, and you talk about the, on the broadcast, you can hear it too with you and Stoney. You guys have talked about the joy that this game is kind of imbued with it matters, doesn't it, when a clubhouse can kind of, 
I don't know, for lack of a better word, harness it and, and use it, especially when it comes from players like your mean Mercedes? Yeah, I mean, you've been, you've been in A-ball clubhouses where guys are, like, over it, in A-ball. And I've been in AAA clubhouses where when you come back from the majors, I mean, there are some really cranky people in those clubhouses. And I don't know how much it affects the win column, but it certainly affects your quality of life, which I think eventually affects the win column in one way or the other. So, yeah, I look. I, the number one reason that I'm glad this clubhouse is what it is and as close is, as what it is, is these guys are really easy to root for. I mean, if you're a Sox fan, you look and you say, like, I literally, not just because they're wearing the jersey, but, like, I want Tim Anderson to do well in life because I want him to get everything that he wants out of life. And you feel that for Mercedes, and you feel it for Lucas Giolito, a guy who, you know, wears his beliefs on his sleeve and is intent on making the world a better place. Like, Baseball can bring you so many things for whatever you feel like your your worldview is. I just think there's a lot to gain for, for for Sox fans as you watch this team. You really want them to do well. Talk with Jason Benetti, the television voice of the uh, White Sox, here on White Sox Weekly, the ESPN 1000 White Sox Network. I'm Connor McKnight. You know, tonight's game is tonight's game. It's Lynn and Cobb, but I couldn't help but notice. Uh, when I saw Fabian Ardaya of The Athletic, who covers the Angels, tweet out that Shohei Otani will not only start Sunday night, but will also hit and hit for himself. I imagine you're geeked about this. I am. I, you know, if, if you were putting it together and getting ready for a cast, I, I feel terrible that you guys, you know, it's this Sunday night game. What are you, you going to do for the Shohei Otani game against the White Sox? I'm going to watch. Uh, and Good plan. See what Good plan. I mean, it's look, the, those are the costs of, of having a good baseball team sometimes. But I think uh, two things. Uh, number one, Joe Madden uh, said, you know, hey, Otani said it's up to Joe Madden whether or not he's going to go ahead and hit. And Joe Madden obviously believes in him enough that, that he's going to go ahead and hit while he pitches. And we were talking about this last night. I mean, the value Otani can bring, if he ends up doing both successfully, the Angels have a much better chance of winning the American League West. And then number two, uh, you were talking about Fabian Ardaya and, and his tweets. The number one tweet uh, that I saw from him about the Angels today was, he said, number one, Chris Rodriguez, when he came out of the bullpen last night, said he blacked out. And then number two, his later quote was, I always do well when I black out. I was like, mm, I, maybe you could prob, maybe you could do okay when you don't black out coming out of the bullpen as well. I've, I've never heard somebody say it exactly like that before. But he's evidently a, had a lot of experiences that are out of body, and he's yeah, good stuff. That is not ex- my experience with that phenomenon. I'm glad for him. He, he was throwing seeds, too. It was fun to watch him pitch as it was uh, the rest of the Sox bullpen and the, um, some of those angels throwing as well. Uh, Jason, the the catching spot behind Yasmani Grandal has been was really the the topic of conversation um, throughout spring. Wonder how you and Steve kind of evaluated Zach Collins, your mean Mercedes, uh, even even Jonathan Lucroy to a point. I know the injury to Eloy Jimenez shifted how the White Sox were going to put things together, but defensively behind the plate after Yasmani, how are you guys feeling uh, about where the White Sox are at? Well, I feel good about it, number one, because the White Sox felt good enough about it to release Jonathan Lucroy. I think if Lucroy was still around, it might have suggested something about the development of the other two behind the plate. And so the fact that the Sox were willing to do that, I think, is an indicator of what they believe of Zach Collins' improvement behind the plate. It's going to be interesting to watch him tonight. I mean, it's our first crack at Zach Collins in the regular season this year with the new uh, catching uh, positioning that he's using and the one knee and everything that comes along with that. And we'll see how he handles a veteran and Lance Lynn. I mean, the good news is he can just basically say, throw some version of the fastball. And that's the end of the night for Lance Lynn. So we know what's coming from Lance, but I think um, we will see how it is and how much success the Sox have receiving wise. But you know, with the loss of James McCann, is more than Lucas Giolito losing his catching running mate. The loss of James McCann is a really sturdy receiver and partner for pitchers and all that comes along with it. And I think I wouldn't say it's 
pressure on Dak and your mean behind the plate. But I would say that one of the things that you'd want is to have somebody really competent in handling a pitching staff if something happens to Yasmani at a point throughout the season. So, uh, you know, we'll watch as the season goes along, and there will be opportunities. I mean, it's not like those guys aren't going to catch, especially Zach, I would say. You know, we'll see him a couple times a week is what I would imagine, uh, at least once a week behind the plate. And I think it's really imperative for the Sox to have somebody who can extremely competently receive behind Yaz. You know, last night's game being as exciting as it was, it's it's a little easy to go past Lucas Giolito's start. Five and a third, eight strikeouts, two runs. I believe it was two walks, but I flipped to the wrong page in my scorebook. Yeah, two walks. Mm. That Tough. That's important. You know, I mean, he, he his opening day start last year did not go the way he wanted to. I wonder what you saw out of Lucas that uh, that enabled him to harness things, I guess, for lack of a better term. I mean... <laughs> So two components. Number one, the Angels just haven't seen this changeup other than a little bit in 2019. And when you strike out David Fletcher twice in a game, it's really difficult to do. That's, that's a feat. And so clearly the changeup was working. I mean, it was, it was an absolute uh, mutant changeup he threw to Mike Trout to strike him out in the first inning. And, you know, we saw some of the slider, not a lot of the slider. And I think Lucas very easily... I don't want to say gets away with because it's his bread and butter, but he can go fastball change, especially against teams who don't know him very well and have grand success. So I think it was more of the same. I think Lucas keeps getting better and keeps changing things. And like there, there's, there's a lot of improvement still remaining in him, but what we see right now is ace of the staff stuff. Jason, appreciate you checking in. Uh, no, you are always welcome on White Sox Weekly, even if it's just to do a Keith Jackson impersonation. I look forward oh, to seeing you. About... I look forward to seeing uh, you at the park very soon, my friend. Yeah, I look forward to it, and that's—I don't really do that good of a Keith. I can do the Sports Center voiceover guy if you want it at some point. Yeah, we can do that. Why don't we? Yeah, you want to hang on the line and lay down a couple of tracks for our, for our guy Eric? White Sox so we can... Weekly, brought to you by the Budweiser Hot Sea. That that really is good. Um, and we might we might we might have a job change uh, here at the uh, here at the White Sox Network. You want me to do your liners? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, is it wrong? Is that wrong? I do. Connor McKnight, brought to you by Brooks Brothers. Oh, Jason, you're the man. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Okay. That's Jason Benetti. He does television for the White Sox. He's very talented and also is going to cut our liners.